And for truly, Lord, we come here today not to get, but to give. To give praise and worship and adoration unto you. Because, Lord, you alone are worthy. So we thank you for this time. Bless it, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Amen and Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 23, shall we? Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're still dealing with the Passion Week of our Lord, the last week of his life and ministry on earth. Uh, last time we were together, we saw how Peter had denied the Lord. In fact, he denied the Lord three times. We, we, we also looked at the trials of the Lord. Now, we had mentioned there are six trials total, three of which we looked at last time we were together. They were the three religious trials. The first was before Annas, the second, Caiaphas, and the third before the Sanhedrin. Now, this brings us to chapter 23 of Luke's Gospel and the second set of trials. These will be the civil trials. There are three of them. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1 of Luke 23, reading down through verse 25. Luke chapter 23, verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, answered him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowd, I find no fault in this man, but... They were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Well, then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing, and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Now that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for before that they had been at enmity with each other. Well, then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and rulers and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it is necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for insurrection and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Now in these first 25 verses, as we've already mentioned, we'll be looking at the three remaining trials of our Lord. We've looked at the three religious trials in chapter 22. Here we have the three civil trials in chapter 23. 
The first trial is before Pilate in verses 1 through 7. The second trial is before Herod in verses 8 through 12. And the third and final trial is again before Pilate in verses 13 through 25. So let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It is the first trial before Pilate in verses 1 through 7. And we would simply mention three things in this first trial. First of all, let's take a look at the accusations against Jesus. The accusations against Jesus. It's in verses 1 and 2. Now in verse 1 of Luke 23, it says, Then the whole multitude, these would be all the religious leaders, the crowd, as well as the Sanhedrin, the whole multitude of them arose and led him, Jesus, to Pilate. Now according to John's account in John 18, 28, after the three religious trials, Jesus was led, then led to what is called the praetorium or the governor's headquarters. This, of course, is where Pilate was at. Now, this particular person, Pilate, becomes a very significant character. According to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 27, verse 2, he's referred to as Pontius Pilate, the governor. And this becomes very, very significant. Because the critics of the Bible, those who deny God and deny the validity of Scripture, soon as they hear the word Pontius Pilate, they begin to leap for joy. Because nowhere, nowhere in secular history do we ever hear or read of Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, only here in the Scriptures. So the Bible critics, those who scoff the Bible and say it's not true, it's full of errors, always brought up Pontius Pilate until June of 1967, uh, 61, excuse me, when an Italian archaeologist, Dr. Frova and his team were excavating at Caesarea. That would be Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea by the Sea, about 30 miles north of Tel Aviv. And in 1961, on that month of June, Dr. Frova and his team unearthed a limestone block and inscribed on this block were the words Pontius Pilate, perfect of Judea, or governor of Judea. So the Bible critics were silenced, as they usually are. As the archaeologists turn their shovels, they find the relics, the ruins. We always see it lines up beautifully with Scripture. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, Ronnie Winter, who is an archaeologist and uh, tour guide in Israel. I've known him for the last 15 years. As he would be guiding us through the land of Israel, he would always say, you know, here the archaeologists unearthed this relic, this ruin, and it proves the Bible to be true. I listened to that for a while until I can take it no more. And on one tour, I stopped him. I said, Ronnie, Brother, I love you. You're, you're a brilliant guy, but here's where you have it wrong. Because archaeology does not prove the Bible to be true. The Bible proves archaeology to be true. Every time the archaeologists dig something up, they turn to the Bible to see what it's all about. Therefore, the Bible validates archaeology. And now, after 15 years of retraining him... He now, on the tour trips, gets it right. Now, notice in verse 2 the accusations against Jesus. There are three of them. The first accusation is insurrection. Take a look. In verse 2, they begin to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nations, causing insurrection, we might say. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. These were flat-out lies. In fact, just the opposite is true. 
Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, when Jesus was talking about Roman soldiers, he said, if one compels you to go one mile, you go two miles. So he is on the opposite end of insurrection. He's submitting to the governmental authorities, the exact thing Paul tells us to do in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Now the second accusation is tax evasion. According to the middle of verse 2, it says, and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Now this, of course, is another flat-out lie. <laughs> In first service, I said, um, now this is a non-truth. And I caught myself. I said, what in, I must be listening to too much news. <laughs> a non-truth? Come on, let's just tell it like it is. It's a flat-out lie. Uh, according to Luke's account in Luke chapter 20 in verse 22 when Jesus was questioned is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not Jesus said render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's so clearly the accusation against tax evasion is a flat out lie the third accusation involves treason treason according to the end of verse 2 that he himself is Christ a king now, Jesus never claimed to be king. In fact, just the opposite is true up to this point. Uh, in John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, in verses 15 and on, we're told the people tried to make him king by force. But he departed from them. So all three accusations are absolutely false. They're lies, to be sure. Which brings us to the second thing we want to look at. We've looked at the uh, accusations against Jesus. Now let's take a look at the question for Jesus. The question for Jesus. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Now this, of course, is a very legitimate question based on the accusations brought against him. And Jesus answered him and said, It is as you say. Now note carefully class, the word it is as is in italics. It's not in the original text. Jesus simply said, you say. Now that's kind of a Jewish idiom for you rightly say. You're true. You're right. So Jesus is in effect saying, I am the king. Clark, are you sure? Oh yes, because in the parallel account, in John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, if you have a kingdom, that means you are the king. So clearly, Jesus is proclaiming to be king because he has a kingdom. But the thought is, you don't have to worry about my kingship, you don't have to worry about my kingdom because my kingdom is not of this world. I'm no threat to Rome. I'm no threat to Caesar. Is Jesus a king? Absolutely. In fact, he's much, much more than just king. According to Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, he is the king of kings and Lord of lords. No, the question is not, is Jesus a king? The question is, is he the king of our lives? Is he the king of kings? Is he the Lord of our lives? Are we submitting to his rulership in our lives, his headship? Are we submitting our will to his will? Are we allowing him to be the Lord of our life, ruling and reigning over the kingdom we call our life? Number three. Let's come to a third matter. We've looked at the accusations against Jesus, the question for Jesus. Now let's take a look at the verdict regarding Jesus. In verses 4 through 7, we see the verdict regarding Jesus. Take a look. In verse 4, it says, Then Pilate said to the chief priest and crowd, I find no fault in this man. This little phrase, no fault, is a legal term. It carries the idea of having your case thrown out of court for a lack of evidence. So the verdict against Jesus, of course, is not guilty. But, according to verse 5, 
They, this Jewish mob with the Sanhedrin, were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now, this is the first true thing they've said. <laughs> Jesus was truly stirring up the people through his teaching from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem. He was filling all of Israel and stirring many people. But he wasn't stirring them up to insurrection. He wasn't stirring them up for tax evasion or even treason. No, he was stirring them up to love each other. He was stirring them up to forgive each other, to exhibit mercy toward each other. That's how Jesus was stirring up the people. How? Through his teaching. As Jesus was teaching, man, he was stirring hearts and changing lives. And that's why we place such great importance on teaching the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says that's where the power is. God's word is powerful. That's what stirs us. In fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, Come now, let us consider one another that we should stir each other up in love and good works. Oh, that we too would be stirred up by the teachings of our Lord. That our hearts would be stirred, our lives would be touched and transformed. That we would now be those motivated by love, by forgiveness, by the mercy of God Toward others. Back to Luke chapter 23. Now, this section concludes in verses 6 and 7, dealing with the verdict regarding Jesus. It says, When Pilate heard of Galilee in verse 6, he asked if the man were a Galilean, and of course, Jesus is. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now, Herod was ruling in the north, in the area of Galilee and Perea. But he, being a half-Jew and half-Idumean, came down from the Galilee to Jerusalem during the time of the Passover. Now remember, Passover, the first feast, which included unleavened bread, Pentecost, the fourth and middle feast, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh and final feast in Judaism, all required mandatory attendance for every able-bodied male Jew, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Now, most scholars believe that during these three feast days, these three festivals, that man, Jerusalem was teeming with people. Some have estimated almost two million pilgrims in and around Jerusalem during this period of time. So, the verdict regarding Jesus was not guilty. Which brings us to the second trial. Back to Luke chapter 23. We've looked at the first trial. It was before Pilate. Now let's take a look at the second trial. It is before Herod. That's in verses 8 through 12. And we would mention three things in this second section as well. Number one. The first thing involves a desire to see Jesus. Man, Herod really had a desire to see Jesus. Look at verse 8. It says, Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad. He was thrilled at the prospect, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, all his teaching, all of his wondrous works, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Now, this second trial is before Herod. This particular Herod is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, who, of course, passed away in A.D. 4, or uh, 4 B.C., excuse me. And Herod Antipas ruled the north part of the Galilee as well as Perea. Uh, this particular Herod, Herod Antipas, was the one that had beheaded John the Baptist. He was in Jerusalem. During this particular feast, Pilate found out Herod was in Jerusalem. Jesus was a Galilean, so he sent Jesus to Herod, and Herod was thrilled at the prospect of seeing Jesus. Why? Well, according to verse 8, because he wanted 
to see a miracle. He wanted to see a sign from Jesus. You know, that's the same thing the religious leaders desired, by the way, back in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 38. They said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and no sign shall be given to it. Well, except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. But here's the interesting thing. Herod wanted to see Jesus only out of curiosity because he thought Jesus was a novelty, some kind of magician or soothsayer. He wanted to see some miraculous sign or wonder from Jesus. He didn't want to know the truth regarding Jesus. I find that interesting because there's a lot of people today who want information about Jesus. They want to hear some things about Jesus. Maybe they even want to hear about miracles performed by Jesus. But they don't want to know the truth regarding Jesus. You see, each and every one of us have a problem. One of the problems that we have is at birth. The moment we are born, we have this emptiness, this void in our soul, in our heart. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, that we are created in futility. We're created in emptiness. We are created with a, a hole in our soul, a void in our heart. God tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that he's put eternity in our hearts. We have this eternal longing, this eternal void. And the problem often is that we try to fill that emptiness, that void, with the things of the world. We think, well, if I can just get that new job, that new car, that new house, that new spouse, that somehow everything will be okay. And we think the grass always looks greener on the other side. And man, if I can just get this, if I just had that, then I'll be satisfied. Hey, nothing can satisfy but Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, a lot of people desire to see Jesus Christ for the wrong reasons, thinking that somehow he's their genie in the bottle, that he's going to grant them their wishes, or he's going to perform some kind of miracle in their life to bless them, to give them wealth and health. Jesus Christ fills the void in our soul. Only Jesus can bring satisfaction, bring completeness. Only Jesus Christ can fill that emptiness in our heart. And unfortunately, Herod was seeking Jesus for the wrong reason. Well, number two. We've looked at the desire to see Jesus. Now let's take a look at the questions for Jesus. The questions for for Jesus. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Then he, Herod, questioned him, Jesus, with many words, many questions. But he, Jesus, answered him nothing. Apparently all of these questions were simply to satisfy his curiosity about Jesus. There was no legitis legitimacy to the questions that were posed to Jesus. As a result of that, at the end of verse 9, Jesus kept silent. Jesus said nothing. This was for at least two reasons. First of all, it was to fulfill scripture. In Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7, it says he was afflicted and yet he opened not his mouth. And as a lamb was led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. So one reason Jesus kept silent was to fulfill Scripture. But I think there's another reason why he kept silent, and that's to set an example for us. 1 Peter 2.21 says Christ is our example. We should follow in his footsteps. And the point is simple. When people come against us, when people speak ill about us or question us regarding something, and we know their motive is impure, we know their lies, half-truths, 
man, the hair on the back of our neck stands straight up. And we just want to, you know, love them and pray for them. <laughs> okay, we want to smack them upside their pointy little head. But you know how we are. We love to stand up and prove our innocence. We love to shout from the rooftop that what they're saying is a lie. It's not true. We always want to open our mouth and you know, justify and vindicate ourselves. The example that Christ said is beautiful. It says, He said nothing. You cannot believe the terrible, awful things people say about me. Well, okay, maybe you can, but... <laughs> but my natural tendency is one to stand up and prove them wrong, to shout my innocence. I remember many, many years ago when, man, the church was just getting attacked. And Sally and I, we were having things said about us that were unbelievable. And they were lies. I mean, flat out. And they were devastating. They were so hurtful. And I remember talking to Pastor Chuck, and I was sharing my heart, Chuck, here's what they're saying, and they're all lies, and man, this and that. And, and he just, just so gracious, you know, allowed me just to blabber on. And, and when I finally shut up, he starts laughing, ha, 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 you know. And I, and I thought, you know, Chuck, this isn't funny. <laughs> he said, you know, Clark, he said, if I were to try to prove my innocence regarding what people said about me, he goes, that's all I would do all day, every day. I wouldn't get anything else done. Wouldn't have time to study, wouldn't have time to teach, wouldn't have time to minister, to serve, weddings, funerals, hospitals, wouldn't have time for anything else. That's all I would do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. He said, does God know the truth? So, well, yeah. He goes, why aren't you okay with that? so true. Why aren't we okay? God knows the truth. We're going to stand before God, not man. Who cares what man says? What difference does it make? God knows the truth. And that should satisfy all of us. Back to Luke chapter 23. Well, let's come to the third and final thing in this second trial. We've looked at the desire to see Jesus, the questions for Jesus. Now let's take a look at the verdict regarding Jesus. The verdict regarding Jesus. That's in verses 10 through 12. Take a look. In verse 10 it says, And the chief priest and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. They were no doubt furious at the decision of Herod. Then Herod, with his men of war, speaking of his troops, treated him with contempt, mocked him, arrayed him with a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. And that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for before that they had been at enmity with each other. Now they're both in Jerusalem. Pilate's at the governor's headquarters, praetorium. Herod is there somewhere, no doubt in a Herodian palace. They were at odds with each other because Pontius Pilate is not part of the Herodian dynasty. He actually took over for Herod Antipas' brother, Herod Archelaus, because Archelaus was removed by Rome. Therefore, there was this rivalry between Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate because of Herod's brother, Archelaus. But after today, they became friends. And this, no doubt, infuri infuriated the Jews. So, the verdict of this second trial regarding Jesus, of course, is not guilty. But it did result in more than that. Not only a second not guilty verdict, the first by Pilate, the second by Herod, but it resulted in a friendship between Pilate and Herod. So two things the Jews did not want to have happen, indeed did happen. 
Which brings us to the third and final trial. And we'll start wrapping this up right here. We've looked at the first trial. It was before Pilate. The second trial, it was before Herod. Now the third trial is once again before Pilate. Back to Pilate in verses 13 through 25. And we would mention three things in this third trial as well. First of all, it involves a proclamation about Jesus. A proclamation about Jesus. That's in verses 13 through 17. Take a look. In Luke 23, 13, it says, Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and rulers of the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accused him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing worthy of death has been done. So this proclamation about Jesus is innocent, both by Pilate and by Herod. But Herod is really on the horns of a dilemma. Because on one hand, the Jews wanted Jesus dead. But on the other hand, Pilate and Herod both found him innocent. Now remember... Israel was teeming with people. If there was another Jewish uprising, an insurrection, a riot in Jerusalem because of these feast days, these festivals, Pontius Pilate would no doubt would lose his governorship. So he wanted to please the Jews, but at the same time, he understood that Jesus was innocent. He goes on in verse 16 to say, I will therefore chastise him, and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. Now this was a custom that came about that during these feast days, a prisoner would be let go to appease the Jews, to make them happy. Now, we don't know when this custom started. It could be coming about on the heels of Leviticus chapter 16 and dealing with the scapegoat how there were two goats and the sins of Israel were placed on the goats. One goat would die, the other goat would be released into the wilderness and gain freedom. Uh, It could have spawned from that particular command of God, but we cannot be sure. Now, the problem here is Pilate was willing to do the wrong thing to find favor in the eyes of the crowd. He was willing to do the wrong thing to find favor in the eyes of the crowd. And that, precious family, is always a mistake. It is always a mistake to try to appease the crowd. Because the crowd is fickle. One day they will love you, the next day they will hate you. I think of ball players. I mean, you know, they're up on this pedestal, they're batting a great average, then all of a sudden they run into a little slump and pretty soon, you know, everybody boos them when they walk out into the field. And we need to be very careful not to play to the crowd, if you will. We see it in churches today. I get uh, mailers all the time from different organizations who want to come into the church and do a demographic study and find out what people really want and what's going to make everybody happy and how, you know, are you kidding me? Listen, you get more than two people in the same room, you're going to have three different opinions. (laughs) Think of that fellow who was shipwrecked on the island. He finally got rescued and the boat came up onto shore and there were three grass huts. And the guy goes, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've been on this desert island for the last 50 years all by myself. It's, you know, I'm going crazy. And the guy goes, oh, you got three huts. He goes, yeah, that's where I live. He goes, what's the second hut? He said, that's my church. He said, what's the third hut? He goes, that's the church I used to go to. (laughs) (laughs) So, So... So we need to be very careful, you see, in this whole, you know, trying to appease, if you will. (laughs) Number two. The second thing involves cries against Jesus. Now we've looked at the proclamation about Jesus. Now let's take a look at the cries against Jesus in verses 18 through 23. 
In verse 18, it says, They all cried out at once, this huge crowd, saying, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city, and for murder. No doubt he murdered a Roman or a Roman soldier in this uprising, this insurrection against Rome. And therefore, they wanted him released. He was like a folk hero, a patriot, we might say. In verse 20, Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said to them a third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. Here, the cries against Jesus are loud. But what I found interesting is that Pilate was persistent. Three times. No, this man is innocent. No, this man is innocent. Three times. Now, we don't get the information here. But in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, we're told why Pilate was so persistent in trying to release Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 27, verses 19 through 24, Pilate's wife, Mrs. Pilate, <laughs> Mrs. Pontius Pilate. Funny. She goes to Pilate and says, Do nothing with this just man, for I have suffered many things in dreams because of him. So don't do anything to Jesus. Wow. So apparently, God was speaking through Pilate's wife, through these dreams or visions, that Jesus was A, a just or righteous man, and that B, Pilate should release him, do nothing to him. Now we do know that Pilate did not heed the voice of his wife, which is always a mistake. <laughs> For many reasons. And today is Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to you all. And men, it would be a good day to heed the voice of your wife today, especially. We're letting Sally barbecue for us all today, so. She's a good mother. You say, Clark, why should we heed the voice of our wife? Good question. Because God has blessed women with a, a sensitivity to the spiritual realm. Men, not so much with us. I mean, we're very stubborn, we're thick-headed, we're blunt, we're, I mean, we're big, we're hairy, we smell bad. I mean, <laughs> but gals are, are very sensitive. They're open to spiritual things. They're in tune to the Lord and they hear from God a lot better than we do oftentimes. And oftentimes God speaks to Sally very clearly. And when she shares something, I think, wow, okay, that was like a word from the Lord for sure. And I believe that is why God made men the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. You say, well, if God made women more in tune to spiritual things, why did he make man the head? For that very reason. What do you mean? Well, because they are open to spiritual things. They also can be open to spiritual things that might not be biblical. Therefore, men, we have the responsibility as the high priest of our home to be those who lead our wives down the path of biblical truth and not allow them to fall into some type of aberrant theology. Well, this brings us to 
to the third and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. Uh, We've looked at the proclamation about Jesus. Uh, We've looked at the cries against Jesus. Now let's take a look at the sentence for Jesus. In verses 24 and 25, we have the sentence for Jesus. In verse 24, it says, So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for insurrection and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered, delivered Jesus to their will. According to verse 24, the sentence was going to be guilty, a death sentence, just as they requested. Now here's a problem. Pilate gave in to the crowd. He feared the crowd more than he feared God. And that is always a mistake. Because when we fear man more than we fear God, we want to please man more than God. Proverbs 29.25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. There's no reason to be afraid of what man can do to us. We always need to stand up for truth. We need to stand up for righteousness. We need to stand up for, for God in the Bible. What's the worst thing man can do to us? Well, ultimately, the worst thing man can do to us is the best thing man can do to us. <laughs> kill us. I mean, we think the worst thing that can happen to us is somebody can kill us. Well, ultimately, that's the best thing that can happen to us. Because I am ready to go home to be with Jesus, I'll tell you that. I mean, not till after the barbecue today, but. (laughs) But ultimately, when we fear God more than man, now we're willing to stand up for what is right. Because we're going to stand before God as judge, not man. And according to the end of verse 25, he delivered Jesus to their will. Here is where their will lined up with God's will. They wanted to crucify Jesus. That was their will. God's will is that Jesus would be crucified. That was God's plan from the beginning. Revelation 13.8. Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus was delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God himself. It was God's will that the Messiah be crucified on the cross, fulfilling the 22nd Psalm. Even Caiaphas made that declaration unbeknownst to him in John chapter 11, verse 50, when he said it is expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, that means that God, listen, that means that God is in absolute, total control. And here we see that God used evil men to accomplish his perfect plan. And that blesses me to no end. Because as I look at things that happen in my life and the life of others, as I look at what's happening in our state, in our nation, around the world, let's face it, sometimes it can be a little discouraging But the truth of the matter is God is in absolute total control. And he's orchestrating everything according to the counsel of his will, according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. And when we understand that, when we realize that, man, we can step back and enjoy that great peace, that great rest in knowing that God is on the throne. Father, How thankful we are for your perfect plan. Lord, your perfect will. And that you use (laughs) even evil people to accomplish it. And Lord, what great rest, what great peace you bring into our hearts. Knowing that, Lord, you are orchestrating all things. 
So Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray that you would continue to grant us that peace that passes understanding, that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it is in that wonderful name that we pray, the name above all names, the King of kings, and Lord of lords we pray, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand?